Well, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Cathy Swift, um, her second talk during Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2015. Uh, Cathy runs the Irish Studies Teaching Programme in Mary Immaculate College, University of Limerick. Uh, she is an MPhil in Archaeology at the University of Durham, a second MPhil in Old Irish Language and Culture from Trinity College, Dublin, and her DPhil was at Oxford and examined the history of the cult of St. Patrick. She has taught in many universities, served 10 years as organizing secretary of the Irish Conference of Medievalists, and runs summer schools in Old Irish in Limerick, when she's not off gallivanting across Europe, with her pilgrim staff, pack the knapsack and tent. And she's going to talk to us today about mice and Viking men. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kathy Smith. Thank you very much. And we've now agreed that I'll, I'll just hold this yoke, which is easier, I think, for everybody. So everybody can hear me, yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, right. On the question of the mice, uh, this was an article um, on the phylogeography of British and Irish house mice that was published in 2009. And they looked at the DNA of, um, roughly speaking, 400 mice. Okay? And they discovered that essentially there is a southern mouse, um, which is essentially a continental mouse, and then there is a northern mouse, which is... Um, uh, well, this is the pattern of, of, of the distribution. And you can see that um, there's a very heavy concentration in the Orkney Islands. They uh, exist in the Outer Hebrides. Um, they exist on Isla. And then my geography colleagues would hate this map because the dots are too big. But you can see it's distributed over, roughly speaking, the northern half of Ireland. Okay? Um, and particularly interesting, there is actually no archaeological traces, so the authors of this article tell us, of mice in Orkney in pre-Viking contexts. And what they concluded was that for the house mouse, sorry, no, no, right, okay. For, for the house mouse, uh, the Orkney uh, mitochondrial DNA of house mice um, represents a marker for Norwegian Viking influence, okay? So that um, the idea is the mouse cr creeps onto the, the, the longship, uh, the long ships then dock, the mice creeps off, and, uh, or the mouse uh, breeds with other mice, and therefore you, get, um, you, can patter, you can pattern human migration on the basis of the mouse migration. Okay? So that's, that map is an interesting map and corresponds to the distribution of uh, early Viking activity, or, or the, um, the analysis of early uh, Viking migration to Ireland. Okay? We have generally assumed uh, that the, the archaeological discussion has primarily focused on Norwegian influence coming around Scotland and, and into Ireland. Okay? This is different from Vikings in England, uh, where they come across from Denmark uh, and across the North Sea, but Irish Vikings initially come from Norway and around Scotland. And we're very privileged at the moment. Um, we've just, uh, the National Museum of Ireland has just published this mammoth volume in their series on, this is a series uh, of volumes which essentially started off as the Wood Key excavation reports. Okay? Um, but this one is called Viking Graves and Grave Goods in Ireland. It's the product of about 15 years of research by a, a wonderful scholar called Stephen Harrison and Rhinel O'Flynn, who's now the director of the National Museum. And it came out uh, earlier this year. And what it's doing is publishing the pagan graves, the pagan Viking graves in Ireland. Uh, pagan because these are the graves w in which people are buried with grave goods. Okay? Um, many of these, most of these, were found in the 19th century. Uh, the records, this is one of the reasons why the project took so long, the records are not particularly good. It coincide, a lot of them coincided with um, at the antiquarian boom around the time of the famine. People were selling the goods on the, on, on the well, I was going to say the black market, but in cer certainly dubious circumstances a lot of the time, and the records aren't great. So there was a lot of chasing material through, um, through archives, etc. 
But what we've ended up with is um, graves which are 9th century in date. Okay, these pagan graves are, are, are generally, as far as we can date, many times they're only collections of artifacts, we don't have skeletons, we don't have carbon-14 dating, but we think that the graves are 9th century in date, for the most part. There's 107 of them. 78 are male, containing one or more weapons. 13 are female, containing one or more oval brooches, which is a particular type of a brooch associated with Scandinavia. Um, and the others are gender neutral, in that people couldn't work out, uh, with, with, in the absence of the skeleton, people couldn't work out whether they were male or female graves. And the really interesting thing uh, is the extent to which these are focused on Dublin. So 81 are in the Dublin region, 81 out of 107. Okay? Um, so this map is actually slightly confusing in that it does give you an impression that there are Vikings all over the place. Yes, there are Vikings all over the place, particularly around the coast, but there is a very, very heavy concentration on Dublin. But if you wanted to uh, sort of extend it from beyond Dublin, there is also, you can probably see, a focus on the uh, eastern half of the island. Okay? Now, you, to some extent, that may be a bias in the record. There's been more excavation on the eastern half of the island. There's been more development on the eastern half. Um, but this is an archaeological set of data going back 200 years. So, um, it, I mean, it, for example, we have very little Viking Limerick, but we had no development in the boom in, Vic in, in, in the centre of Limerick. So that we probably should have Viking Limerick if only we dug it up. Kind of thing. So there are modern biases, but the, the length of time we're dealing with here probably suggests that the bias is, is, is relatively small here. And certainly when you compare that pattern of Viking graves with the pattern of early Viking raids on Irish churches described in the annals, um, obviously for, for a, um, a pagan grave, there is some element of, of you know, uh, some element of settlement or continuity at a location, whereas a raid can obviously be a, a temporary seasonal thing. But again, you see a pattern which is predominantly east coast for the raids. Okay, um, this is only this is only half the ninth century, but the pattern doesn't change much when you move into the second half of the ninth century. And as I say, the consensus is that these Vikings, these ninth century Vikings, our first Vikings, come from Norway. Um, and this map over here is an older map done in the 1980s, and it represents grave goods with Irish-style art found in Norwegian graves. And you can see they're predominantly here on the southwest coast of Norway. And again, that has been updated in the last year. This is an article by Dagfin Scray, the man who dug in Kalpang, um, which is a big uh, trading center down here. That's that dot there. Uh, and he has uh, argued that you can see three uh, areas associated with the Irish Sea in Scandinavia. Um, the west coast, essentially where our grave goods are, um, of the area around Count Pang, down in the south, um, and then various areas in Denmark. But he agrees that the earliest raids in Ireland um, are probably to be connected with the West Coast, and that it's only after the development of uh, early towns, and this word Longfort means a protected ship place, the development of those into proto-towns and towns, um, they, he reckons that's related to the trading networks which are further south in Denmark and in um, southern Norway. Okay, So there we have our first Viking migration, our first Viking age, coming to us from Norway. One of the reasons why early Irish history is uh, one of the glories of European civilization um, is because of our, uh, our records in the annals. We have very detailed annals uh, in a way that other countries uh, don't have. Um, 
And we have, a, in those annals, we have a second Viking Age, um, beginning in the 10th century, early 10th century, when we get a, a number of references to large fleets, possibly organized by royalty, um, coming into various points in Ireland. And here we see, uh, unlike the concentration solely on Dublin, which we had in the 9th century, in the 10th century, we have the fleets coming into Waterford Harbour. So in 914, a great new fleet uh, of the, the pagans arrive in. Um, the fleet of Limerick in 921. Um, and then the, uh, in the, uh, we can start seeing competition. These, these Vikings are not all working together. So we have competition and fights between the different Viking leaders in Waterford, Dublin, and Limerick. Okay, so in 923, the Dubliners get a bit uh, cranky. The Limerick Vikings are doing very well, and they're raiding up the Shannon and, and um, getting a lot of loot in, on Loch Ree and in Clomac Noise. And lo and behold, Dublin sort of moves in and tries to take over. But they fail. Okay? On that occasion. So that's the historical evidence for the Second Viking Age. Um, the archaeological evidence for the Second Viking Age is probably best um, looked at through the uh, distribution of uh, coins and silver. Okay? Um, you probably know that one of the things that Scandinavians did in terms of European history is that they um, encouraged a, a, a great flow of silver from the Near East, from uh, places like Iran and Iraq and Persia, uh, coming up through the eastern half of Europe, through the, the rivers that the, 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 the Swedes were, uh, uh, were sailing down and landing up in southern Scandinavia. And from there, they then distributed that silver through uh, Western Europe. And if you look at the pattern for the hordes from Ireland, you can see that there's some evidence for silver coming in in the 9th century, but it's relatively small, and then you get this sudden boom from about 950 on, okay? Um, and that, that's a very interesting pattern because after all, Brian Baru is, uh, dies in 1014, and one of the reasons Brian Baru manages to have the career he does is because there's an awful lot of money. We've just, we're coming out of a big boom, and, and, and that's probably why political events work the way they did, at least. It's a contributing factor. Now this silver is divided into different um, types. There's silver which is simply uh, um, silver used for brooches and for ornament and, and for armlets. And then there is silver which is used for coinage. And then you have what's a mixed hoard where you get both or you also get uh, the, the jewellery cut up into what's called hack silver. And John Sheehan is the great expert on this. He's UCC uh, in Cork. And he has divided the silver hoards into uh, different categories. So you have class one silver hoards are whole ornaments, mainly, mainly arm rings. And that's 39% of all hoards, 40%. And most of those are found on Irish ring forts. Okay? Uh, and then you have the class two hoards, which are complete ingots and complete ornaments. Um, and then you have the class four hordes, which are hack silver, uh, where you have complete ingots, complete ornaments, and uh, torn up uh, bits of things. Okay, and what you find is is a lot of uh, in a number of locations you find weights that they would actually measure scales for measuring the hack silver, and therefore when you wanted you know dinner or to buy a slave, you went down and you said, well, I'm throwing the arm ring or a bit of my arm ring onto the scales, and I want four slaves and, and a cow. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but this, this kind of hack silver, where the, the silver is being used in effect as a form of coinage, okay, for exchange, um, this typically is found on Cranoke sites, uh, especially in the center of Ireland around Loch Ennell. And these are, 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 as I've already mentioned, 10th century. Okay? And this pattern, so ring fort owners using silver for personal adornment, and Cranog owners trading in silver and using it as a form of commerce, this dip, these patterns differ from the coin hoards. The coin hoards tend to be found on church sites. 
Okay? And the coins involved tend to be Anglo-Saxon. So that's a third pattern. And those, and those Anglo-Saxon coins can be used as, again, like the mice, to signify where we see most of our Vikings coming from in the second Viking Age, which seems to be coming through Britain. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but I just want to give you some examples of the, uh, what the ornament, that, the kind of ornaments we're talking about look like. People, most people have probably heard of the Arda Chalice, yeah? um, famous as uh, an icon of early Christian Ireland. The silver involved in making the chalice is actually Roman silver. It's a pre-Viking chalice, uh, but it was found in a large ring fort um, in West Limerick. And actually inside the hoard, very few people talk about this, but inside the hoard were a number of brooches. And the brooches were later in date from the chalice and indeed Viking period. Okay. So we have one brooch uh, of um, a famous, you know, our most uh, illustrious pre-Viking style brooch, similar to Tara in Ireland, the Tara brooch in Ireland, or the Hunterston brooch in Scotland. Um, and we have an, an Ardach brooch of that type. Okay, you can see heavily ornamented with uh, um, silver gilt and uh, chip carving. So that's a pre-Viking style. But we also get these silver brooches, entirely silver. The other ones, the previous one is copper with a silver gilt um, overlay. The silver brooches of Arda type are pure silver. And uh, these we find uh, two in the, in the Arda hoard, and then we have other ones from Cahircomon, which is the other side of the Shannon estuary in County Clare. And these would be Viking period in date, um, 9th to early 10th centuries. And then the latest one, again, and you can see the weight of the silver is increasing. This is what's called the thistle brooch. And again, in North Munster, we have at least six of these. Um, but we also have them. They're very prominent in, in, in Dublin. And again, you find them a lot in Scotland as well. Okay? If, you beat to, if anybody has a chance to go to the National Museum, um, you'll find examples of thistle brooches, which are absolutely enormous, and, and, and it's a, a really intriguing question as to how people actually wore them. And one theory is they actually wore them on their back, because if you wear them in the front, um, yeah, um, well, particularly for women, it's going to be extremely uncomfortable. Before we start looking at, um, for Viking DNA, I've gone through the archaeological and historical evidence in some detail because it's important, I think, to establish um, the contemporary evidence for the Viking footprint, as it were, in Ireland. Um, and there is a problem that uh, Vikings are a good box office. Everybody likes Vikings. Um, and this particular map, for example, um, is based on, this map here is based on 19th century place names which refer to Vikings uh, and to names like Danesfort. But I don't, really, I don't really think you can use it as evidence for the original Vikings. This is after Vikings have become popular in the Romantic period and so forth. Yeah? And similarly, the map on the other side is a map of, um, uh, based on 17th century census data for a particular surname called Doyle. The Dovgal etymology of that is debated by historians. And anyway, it's 17th century, and it doesn't really tell you about the Viking period in origin. So just to be careful um, about trying to look for contemporary evidence for Vikings as opposed to uh, the, 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 the pro-Viking um, uh, evidence of later periods. Okay. How does the patterns Norwegian mice, Norwegian uh, origins in the 9th century, British origins, for our British, heavily British influenced Vikings coming in in the 10th. How does that compare with the DNA studies? Well, in 2006, Dan Bradley, who spoke to us yesterday, um, his lab did an article on the scale and nature of Viking settlement in Ireland. And that's been summarized in popular discourse as saying, Vikings contribute relatively little to Irish population, uh, and there was no Scandinavian DNA legacy to speak of. Okay? Um, 
Now, for archaeologists and historians, particularly of my generation, who were brought up with the Woodkey finds, that was a bit of a shock. Yeah? Um, and we were slightly stunned by that. Uh, the idea was that although we have quite a lot of Viking artifacts, what they are doing is simply Irish people using, you know, importing, as it were, the equivalent of Italian leather couches and Porsches um, and sort of going around saying, aren't we trendy, but actually not, um, not large numbers of Vikings as such moving in and settling in Ireland. Okay? But of course the problem is, this is a 2006 article, and as Dan Bradley was saying yesterday, the methodologies that was used to produce that article are now no longer, uh, um, you know, they're a bit outdated, so can the conclusion still stand? Because one of the interesting things about that article is that it does contrast with other uh, admixture and DNA studies that were done in other parts of, of the British Isles, uh, namely this one by uh, Sarah Goodacre, uh, which argued heavily for... Um, it was an, uh, a both white chromosome and mitochondrial DNA study, and it said that in the Northern Isles, you get both peoples moving in, sorry, both males and females moving in, but as you get further and further away from the homeland into Iceland, what you get essentially are uh, Scandinavian males and Irish or, or Hebridean females. That was the pattern that, that they identified. Okay, so the research backdrop to the 2006 study was, first of all, it was part of, a, as you probably know, a very big study um, of approximately 1,700 people, I think, um, in total. But um, what they did was, to pick out the Viking influence, they looked at surnames uh, with, which had Norse personal names or nicknames. Okay? Although they did say not every putative Norse surname was necessarily founded by a Norse male. Okay, and bear that in mind, because we'll come back to that. And this is the list of the Norse surnames that they identified, Arthurs, Burns, Blyes, Bolands, etc. Because they were relying on a, on a collection by Edward McLeiset, they didn't go through the etymology of these names or why they identified them as Norse. They just relied on McLeiset. Uh, unfortunately, MacLyser, in turn, is writing very much a summary of different families, and he doesn't give you the evidence either. Okay? Um, and there are certain problems with this list um, when you go through it in detail. And one of the interesting things is there's no MacAuliffe there, although we do know that Olaf, or Aulaf in the, in the Irish spellings, um, is a very common name, particularly among the, the Dublin Norse leadership. And MacAuliffe is still a very common name, particularly in North Cork. Um, the other thing that they argued was that their assumptions had to be uh, required that um, the personal names from where these, uh, these surnames came from should be largely restricted to the big uh, Hiberno-Norse settlements, namely um, Dublin, Limerick, Waterford, and then lesser ones in Wexford and Carlingford and so forth, okay? In other words, they said uh, very clearly, well, this is the approach we're taking, but it, it may be flawed because uh, the names which are putatively Norse in origin may in fact be, have been given to genetically native Irish, insofar as you can use the word native, but ge genetically non-Scandinavian, yeah? So when you go through the list in detail, the name Lachlan, for example, that's a classic example of this because Lachlan was taken over by the Irish as a personal name. And if you look, um, Jared showed the uh, McFurbishy book of genealogies earlier on. If you go through that list, uh, that, that material, you get Lachlan turning up uh, as a personal name in the Connacht of Ruin, which is uh, South Roscommon and Galway, uh, North Galway, the Arila in County Armagh, uh, the Shilir, um who are distributed across the country, but very specifically the Corcoran Druid of the uh, Burren in Clare. The, the name turns up among the Dalgosh, among the Northern Inhale, um, among the people of Connemara, among the Ivania in Central Ireland, among the Ogunacht of Cashel, among the Leinstermen. In other words, the name is found all over the place, and therefore somebody descended from a Lachlan has no obvious connection with Dublin, Limerick, or Waterford. 
Um, a second case is the McAuliffe name, which I mentioned before. In a Scottish uh, context, uh, this name becomes Macaulay. Um, they end up not pronouncing the double F that we pronounce. Um, and that can be spelled, you're probably more used to the spelling as Macaulay uh, in that spelling there. Um, and um, a guy called Alistair Moffat did a study of um, a Fred Macaulay. And he He's working very much of, if you have an Olaf ancestor, then he must be an, a, a, a Scandinavian of some kind, and he produces this fantastic story uh, about how um, the ancestor of, of his sample uh, was bought by a Viking lord from the Hebrides, uh, who was probably called Olaf, and he, he bought a slave from Munster in, in the slave market in Dublin, and uh, they sailed back to the Hebrides, and at some stage on the journey, they stopped off. I presume they didn't do this on the ship. Uh, they stopped off, and the slave snuck away with a Macaulay woman, uh, with Olaf's woman, and suddenly we have an insinuation of monster DNA into the um, um, profile. Well, as I say, it's a great story, um, but it is uh, baloney, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of another way of putting it. Um, because... Again, Aulif becomes a very common name uh, among the Irish in the post-Viking period. Uh, the 61st most common personal name, in fact, in McFurbish's uh, genealogies. And not only that, but we have a uh, 15th century account of a leading dynasty of McAuliffe's uh, who come from Munster, exactly the area where he had his DNA sample, uh, in Duhallow in County Cork. Okay? So I have to say, in this case, I don't think McAuliffe's are showing the, uh, um, Scandinavian DNA for a very good reason that they were never Scandinavian. They simply adopted the name. Okay, so I've been negative about two. Can I be positive about a third? Um, Harold, the name Harold that uh, it was included as a surname in that list. Um, there was a Harold who was grandson of Ivar, and he was king of Limerick in the mid-10th century, and he died fighting the Connachta um, in, in, in the West. But there are also, um, Harold is a very common name in this period, there is also the sons of Harold who um, are active in Waterford, okay, in 984, towards the end of the, ninth, of the 10th century. And then we have a Harold belonging to the Dublin dynasty, who dies at the Battle of Glen Mama. Um, this is the first attack by Brian Maru on Dublin in 999. And he dies, he's a, um, he's a son of the then King of Dublin, the Harold, okay? Um, so we have Harolds in our three Hiberno Norse big settlements, Dublin, Limerick, and uh, Waterford in the 10th century. Uh, when we look for later surnames, we have in the Dublin Guild Merchant Road, we have, um, Harolds who are merchants of Dublin in 1232 and 1253. At least two of these come from Chester, in 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 the uh, you know near to the Wirral, south of Liverpool. Okay, uh, and again, when you come look at Limerick, you have Harolds certainly from the end of uh, of the 13th century. Um, and there seems to be enough of them at the end of the 13th century that they don't belong to a single family. Okay, there's more than one family of Harolds at that stage. I haven't found them in Waterford yet, but I'm still hunting. And, okay, so we have Harolds in our Hiberno North settlement. Um, but in fact, does that necessarily mean they are original 10th century Vikings, or could they have come in in the 11th or indeed the 12th century? One of the interesting things is when you look for, at the Dublin Guild Merchant Roll, which is a fantastic roll, it's equivalent to the material you get from Leicester in England, a very early list of citizens of Dublin. Um, but when you look at, at that, it's got sh about 1,600 names, and you're hunting for Norse names, the interesting thing is you have some guys here like Torsten the Outlaw in Norse, that's fine. Um, you've got Ern Finn, a son of Gilla, that's fine, perfectly plausible. But then over here we have Torkel of Cardiff, okay, 
So a nice uh, Norse name, but associated with Cardiff. We have Svein, again, a nice Norse name from Cardiff. And we have Ivar, a nice Norse name from Cardiff. So again, you've got to wonder, just because you have Norse names, has, you know, the history of the Viking settlement in Britain and Ireland is that by the time we get the records of people in detail, uh, Norse personal names have spread throughout the population as a whole in both Britain and Ireland. So I'm a bit dubious about my heralds. Another approach is to look at names which um, the TCD study didn't look at. Okay? And here I go back to Dovaltuk McFeerbisha. Uh, Dovaltuk McFeerbisha uh, is, uh, writes, is a collector. Okay? Um, he, he puts together not, more, not one account, but numerous accounts of genealogies, and he's also in contact with other experts who are putting together genealogies. And at one point he says, okay, um, there are many names and some surnames which are reckoned as occurring, are originating in the Viking conquest of Ireland. Most of these are now closely identified with English surnames. Uh, and the same names also used to be found with the Vikings or Saxons. So it's very, not easy at all to discover their true origins because the country that is England has never been anything other than a corridor for invaders. Okay, this is, this is Double Tuck's approach to life. And we have Albany and Britons and Crithney and Gael and Scots and Saxons and Vikings and Danes. And it just shows you different perspectives, per perhaps, on, on the history we're normally taught. Um, but he then goes on to say, um, very difficult to distinguish, therefore, Norse names from English names. Um, but he cites this guy called Richard Verstegen, who suggests that color names were typical. In the 17th century, when Dubbeltuck is writing, Richard was suggesting that color surnames were particularly common among the Vikings. And then Dubbeltuck says, well, I'm not sure I believe that, but um, here are a whole list of color names, and he gives, he gives them in Irish for the most part. Um, but again, if we go back to our Dublin Guild merchant role, um, with names, we're not quite sure when it begins, but these are names prior to AD 1222. And we suddenly find we have a large numbers of people who, with the nicknames Albus, meaning white, or Finn, okay, which means white in Irish. We have nine of them um, who, who refer, seem to have the word black, uh, we have five with the word brown. We have uh, another 11 or so with, the word, with various forms of the word red. And then we have other nicknames like long, nine longs, uh, two what seems to be small, uh, and then people who are called younger. Okay, and these are nicknames. But the interesting thing is that all of these nicknames become surnames. And all of these surnames are traceable in the 13th century records of the Anglo-Norman colony in Ireland. They're obviously typical of, of names that you get in England as well, but I'm only interested in the Irish evidence. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the whites, the very heavy predominance of whites. It makes perfect sense that for an Irish people looking at Scandinavians or indeed English people, they are struck by the percentage of blondes in the population. Um, and it is clear that in Norse nomenclature, white is a, uh, both a personal name and used as, as um, it becomes a surname. Okay, and this is Gillian Fellows Jensen writing about the personal names of, uh, from Lincolnshire and Yorkshire, where the Vikings were particularly settled in particularly large numbers. And here we have the uh, Norse word, word hivit, which is um, white. Okay. And we not only have these large numbers of whites in Dublin, we have large numbers of whites in Limerick as well. And not only whites, but we also have blondes in various spellings. Um, and we also have the Irish equivalent called Finn. Um, and here's a very interesting reference. Uh, Walter de Capilla, uh, Walter Chapel, um, who was a Hibernicus, he was an Irishman, um, and he found that he wasn't getting on well within the city of Limerick but because um, he, was, he didn't have legal status, 
Um, he was originally an O'Finn, a, 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 a white, um, but he renamed himself as Walter de Capla in order to make his life as a merchant in Limerick easier. Okay? And again, the O'Finns and Finn surnames you can tra trace in Waterford, in Limerick. I haven't got them in Dublin, but again, we're seeing a focus around the big Hiberno North settlements. And this is just the later history of, of whites in, in our medieval Ireland. You can see there's a bunch of them in Dublin. Um, you can also find them in Bunratty, in Kilkenny, in Ratos, in County Meath, in Carlingford, in Thurlis, in Carlow. Um, so we have whites essentially all over the Anglo-Norman colony. But one interesting factor of their distribution is that this is a map of all the Viking style uh, artifacts from Limerick, essentially all of which turn up east of the River Deal, and that is also the distribution of the pre-Norman whites where we can locate them in Limerick. So, what does this tell us? Well, um, if you look at uh, the Family Tree DNA site for uh, whites, obviously, for obvious reasons, most of the whites involved seem to be uh, have English ancestry or British ancestry. Um, but one of the interesting things is that one of their signatures, a, a, a large percent, not a large percentage of them, but a, there's a substantial group who have um, IM253, which according to ISOG is, has the highest frequency in Scandinavia, Iceland, and Northwest Europe. They still can't distinguish between Viking ancestry and um, Anglo-Saxon ancestry, but given, as I say, that from the 10th century on, most of our Vikings seem to come to Ireland through Britain, I'm, go I'm going to discard that as a problem uh, in a lordly sort of uh, effervescent sort of way. Um, and where the map, again, the dots are too large to be really diagnostic, but I think with, a with an optimistic eye, you can see a concentration of whites with this IM253 signature turning up around Dublin, around Waterford, around Limerick, and then you also get them on the northeast coast, and unexpectedly you get them in Connacht. But it seems to me that the methodology that was used by Trinity in assuming that simply because a surname, which was after all invented long after the Vikings settled, has Norse language elements in it, it automatically meant Norse, original Norse settlers. That methodology is flawed. Um, and I just want to compare, the, I, I use this slide a lot. Uh, it was given to me by Christina Lee of Nottingham based on a study that was done in the Wirral um, in two, published in 2008. And the Vikings of the Wirral actually come to Britain from, anybody know? From Ireland, okay? Um, and the, we have an account of this, I'm not sure I have a slide of it, but we have a, a, a detailed account of how um, they, they, they migrated during the interregnum, as it were, between the first Viking Age and the second Viking Age, the Vikings of Ireland seems to have settled in this in West Lancashire in the world. What they did, what happened in this particular study was um, the Wirral is quite close to uh, uh, Liverpool, and when they studied people uh, on a sort of random Wirral people on a random basis, they ended up with one uh, signature, as it were. But when they then looked at people whose names were attested in the medieval period, surnames from medieval Wirral, uh, they got a rather different signature. Okay? And they were very happy because they felt there was more evidence for Scandinavian migration among people with medievally attested surnames. Now the names they used, if you look at them, um, these are the names they used from uh, the 16th and uh, uh, 14th centuries. But I want to draw your attention to the word young in the first list, the word brown in the second list, the word cook, uh, which I didn't talk about, but which is well attested again in our Anglo-Norman records in Ireland, Sergeant Walsh, which is the um, um, very common in the Anglo-Norman colony uh, used to describe people who are Welsh. And here 
we have names which you can find, in other words, in both Ireland and England. And given our heralds of Chester who came over from Dublin, and given our Dublin Vikings who settled in the Wirral, um, and this comes back to what we were talking about yesterday in the paper, we have a lot of, of, of fragments of evidence here which show people moving backwards and forwards across the Irish Sea in this period. Okay. We also have records of trade. Uh, the Irish sold uh, pine martens, uh, pine marten skins to, in Chester, um, they, where they made cloaks of them and they gave them to the kings and queens of Scotland and so forth. Um, this is the account of uh, the, the settlement of the Wirral. It comes from a text known as the, uh, the Fragments, the Three Fragments. Um, and it talks about the expulsion of the Norse host from Ireland. The, according to this author, it was, it was uh, put together by an O'Clery uh, and, and therefore interested in, in, in sort of the power of the church to move these things. He said they were expelled not by the fighting Irish, but by the prayers and, and fasting of a particular Cayley day. And they departed from Ireland, and uh, their name, their leader was Ingemund, and they went to Queen Edelfreda of the Saxons, uh, and she gave him lands near Chester. And then they had various battles, because the Chester folk weren't terribly happy about this, uh, but in the end, he ended up occupying Chester and possessing it with his lands and wealth. Okay. So my conclusions, therefore, are... We have archaeological, historical, and probably genetic evidence which suggests that there are Norwegian settlers in Ireland uh, in the 9th century. Okay? And that is, as it were, the traditional picture of Viking activity in Ireland. But that 9th century settlement seems to be predominantly, so far, east coast, and absolutely predominantly focused on Dublin, as far as we can tell. Um, and then in the 10th century, we, and later, we have people arriving into Ireland with Norse names, but they also have strong connections to Britain. And indeed, one of the big mysteries for Irish archaeologists is, if you say uh, Vikings, are, 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 um, Vikings come to Ireland and they start Viking towns, why is it that you don't have large numbers of towns in Scandinavia? And one of the theories that Pat Wallace always used to say was because they learned about towns in Britain before they came to, to, to Ireland. Um, so the second Viking wave is, as it were, whatever term, if we talk about Hiberno-Norse, we have to talk about British Viking or, so, or some, some term like that. Okay? It's not straight from Scandinavia, as far as we can tell. And... The third point is that looking at the surnames that were chosen for the 2006 TCD study suggests that their um, methodology, which they themselves pointed out was problematic, um, is even more problematic with further investigation. And you cannot assume that um, the surnames they tested are necessarily um, people of Viking ancestry. And so when they said that only 10% of the Irish population ended up as uh, were, were, were Vikings, um, that conclusion has more or less, as far as I can say, as far as I know, and there are people here who are more expert than I am, as far as I know, the eye signature in terms of modern DNA testing is still relatively small and still might be of the order of 10%. But the methodology by which TCD got to that uh, figure is now, in my view, outdated and has to be abandoned. And I'd also say, um, and again, this fits in with what other papers have been saying, it's going to be very, very difficult, given the history, uh, both of the Viking period and the subsequent history of Britain and Ireland, to distinguish between Vikings who arrived, as it were, um, as monolingual Norse speakers, untainted by, by British exposure, and Vikings who come having been settled in Britain for a number of years and then arrive in, uh, in Ireland, whether in the 10th century, uh, the 12th century is the Anglo-Norman period, um, the uh, 15th century in the Elizabethan period, the 17th century in the Cromwellian period, you're going to get people with Viking ancestry coming into Ireland, as indeed you get people with both Irish and Viking ancestry migrating back to Britain. 
and I think that's just a feature of the history of our islands, and there's really not a lot we're going to be able to do with it long term, I, I would feel. That would be where I'd stand anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was great. Um, we have a question here from Don Brassel. Thank you very much, Kathy. That was very interesting. Uh, can I sort of rewind back yeah. to the Macaulays? Because I'm a, a member of that same sort of monster clade. Okay. And the like. So it's, it's, it's characterised by a particular marker found in Macaulays, the monster Irish marker. It's also found in Westerns in Scandinavia mm. with people with Scandinavian surnames. So since you uh, weren't much impressed with Alistair Moffat's fairy story, would you speculate as to how these monster Irish genetically ended up in Lewis and Harris and then potentially in Western Norway and in Denmark? Okay, um, well, uh, the, the trouble with, with, when I come to these conferences, I'm always very conscious that I come from, the genetics I read tend to be old papers, essentially, and you have this snip avalanche going on, and I'm always behind the, the, behind the, the, the curve, as it were, uh, and you always know a lot more about, than I do about where the, where, what's happening with the snips. Um, the, um, there is clear evidence that one of the things that the Vikings do uh, in, in, in Ireland is that they, uh, they trade in slaves. And uh, the Irish uh, have find this absolutely wonderful because they go to war with their local enemies. Um, they defeat their local enemies. Now, in the old days, they would take a percentage of them as hostages and they would hold them for ransom. But in the Viking period, there's an even better solution. You go down the road and, and you sell your enemies to the Viking lords, which gives you silver. Um, and, and you, A, diminish the power of your enemies and, B, you make a profit. I mean, brilliant solution. Um, and as a result of that pattern, um, we have very clear evidence that, that, uh, from a variety of sources that um, there is a trading market going on between Bristol and Ireland. There's slightly less evidence, but I, still, I think is still interesting evidence, suggesting a trading network between Ireland and Cordoba in the south of Spain. Um, but there's also evidence, clear evidence, for a lot of trafficking up the Hebridean coast. Um, and I'm not, essentially, you know, it, just like the SNPs, this is a matter of baby steps. Um, and, and my point about uh, the McAuliffe name is I'm not saying that there are no McAuliffe's who don't have Scandinavian ancestry or Scandinavian connections. But what I'm saying is you have to bear in mind that it was certainly used of um, a lot of people who in our records are Irish. But again, we may discover that's wrong longer term. I mean, one of the things that the, the whole Brian Roo celebrations has sort of focused on or turned up is the number of Scandinavians who are, whose names be, are translated into Irish in the 10th century. And then for we just see them as Irish. But in fact, when you think about it, they're probably Scandinavians in an Irish dress. So for example, cotters, I think I said this yesterday, cotters and McCotters uh, are, are seen as from the Norse name Otter. But suddenly, at the time of the Battle of Clontarf, you suddenly get this personal name, Dovahu, turning up, and that's the Irish word for Otter. And you've got to wonder, is that actually simply a translation then of, 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 the, uh, of the Norse name? So again, essentially I'm going for model. Okay, I'm not going for a clear solution to any of these problems. I'm going for a lot of people moving around in a lot of different directions and all our records. By using different disciplines, we can try and minimize the problems. But all our records are suggesting that, in fact, people had a... This was a time of expansion. People were moving around a lot. The ships facilitated communication. And from the point of view of this conference, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that I don't think you're going to get, from this early period, very clear signatures which are one surname, one ancestry, um, because I, that's not the picture I'm seeing in the documents or in the archaeology.
Goldberg. Uh, another name where I think we might saw it may have been, I mean, you were safe with Byrne, B E I R N E. Mm -hmm. According to him, a Viking named uh, Bjorn, uh, yeah. B J O R N, went up to Shannon and settled there and the tribe was in from him, clan, etc., whatever you call it. Uh, however, we, we've, uh, we have about, well, it doesn't matter how many we have, we've de uh, snip tested four or five of the people who live around Elfin. Jamestown, whose surname is that, B E I R N E, and they're all DF 5s. I don't think DF 5 is found much in Norway at all. They seem to be most closely related to the Canes of Galway. Uh, well, and that makes an awful lot of sense because, in fact, if you look at um, Kuno Meyer's work uh, about the etymology of the name Brian, they're, they're, they're the early, there's an early group of the Connacht who are the Evuin, okay? And that's um, that's B-R-I-O-N, okay? Um, and the genitive B-R-I-U-I-N, okay? And what Kuno Meyer talks about is, 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 you know, to what extent is that the name that becomes Brian down in, in, in Clare? And he has a, a long argument, which I won't bring you into. But there is an absolute fear that in the 10th and 11th century, that the spelling Brian and Brian was going backwards and forwards, and people were spelling it the same way. So I think it's much more likely. The Evruin were in, uh, in, in North Galway and in South South Common, and it seems to be much more likely your burns are related to them than, 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 than to Scandinavians. And we have a question from... No? No? Uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Okay. Um, where are we going to be with all of this in five years' time? It's my favorite question to ever ask. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I don't think the archaeology is going to change much, okay? Um, the National Museum has just done uh, this major, major study that they've been investing in on the graves for a number of years. Uh, Pat Wallace, um, uh, Rhino O'Flyne is, is as Viking, as it were, in his interests as Pat Wallace, or almost as Viking. Um, but he is going to be taken, there's not much money in the, uh, in the National Museum coffers at the moment and they're being pressurized about 1916. So I don't think there'll be much work being done on Viking archaeology uh, through the museum in the near future. And the, um, the, it's really the National Museum who've driven Viking archaeology in this country because of Pat Wallace's excavations at Woodkey. Um, uh, so what's been, what they will probably do is that they have started this pattern of uh, inviting particularly uh, British PhD students who are funded to do uh, reports and studies of particular types of artifacts from the excavations in Dublin and that will probably continue. So we will see the, but this is, isn't going to change the picture much I don't think because it's, it's like studies of barrels, studies of scabbards, studies of, of, of shoe leather. Um, and it's not really going to change the overall p pattern of migration, I don't think. Um, in terms of the history, uh, well, one of the things about 1014 and the celebrations last year is that it crept up on a number of, we were a very small bunch of early Irish historians, but to some extent it clearly crept up on people. And um, what was noticeable this year was a number of new studies. Last year, a lot of the, what happened last year was actually more or less a repetition of what we already knew. But it started people asking questions. And now this year on the conference circuit, there were a number of new papers looking at new approaches. So I think that will continue. There will be a, a sort of a shadow effect of the 2014 celebrations. So the history will, is likely to have new material coming out. Uh, on the DNA, there are people here much more qualified than I am, <laughs> and I, I don't know that I can talk about this in detail. But just to say that um, what I'm hoping, I'm doing a project in Limerick, which is on Limerick surnames in general, but we have a lot of Old English uh, surnames in, 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 in Limerick, and we have a lot of Anglo-Norman records of surnames in Limerick. And unlike, say, the Munster project, we then spend a lot of our time thinking about those people and those names. And I think one of the problems in DNA studies in, up until now, has, in terms of the overall interpretation, has been that people have tended to focus in on diagnostically linguistic Irish names 
or diagnostically linguistic whatever names. And I think my understanding is that surnames actually happen after all the great invasions happen and they're acquired for a variety of reasons um, and there's, it seems to me, a lot more influence by, of the English system of surname formation on the, sur on the formation of Irish surnames than has previously been identified and there's a lot more overlap and even as far as, I mean, the Irvings in the last paper and you had the uh, Kirikon um, surname in Limerick on one of his slides and the changeover seemed to happen coming up to the famine. Well, again, that's a pattern we haven't really looked at. A lot of Irish families, because they were migrating, and because of the, you know, no Irish need apply, and, and, the, and the pejorative uh, attitudes of, of some of the host countries to Irish language speakers, a lot of them took their Irish name and, and woke up the following morning and said, we're going to call ourselves Bowen or, or uh, Clark, or, or, well not Clark, Clark doesn't count, but uh, Bowen or Morgan or um, Irving or, or some name that sounds terribly worthy and, and non-native Irish, non-Irish speaker. And we can see that pattern in the 19th century, in the, in the periods coming up to the famine and after the famine. But again, we haven't studied that. And I think, again, according to the, the slide when, when um, um, James was talking about the, the different ways in which people could have a non-paternity event. There's a specific set of non-paternity events that happen in Ireland because of our status as a colony, which needs to be looked at. And again, we need, as I keep saying, we need more research on this. So that's as far as I can go. Great. Well, I know that you are doing some research in Limerick, and that study probably will run for quite a few years. Yeah. But hopefully you can come back at some stage and give us an update on the current status. We yes. much appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your...